Reefs Go Live for our fabulous Food Chains broadcast. My name is Maisie and I am a marine scientist at the Central Caribbean Marine Institute and I am lucky enough to be your topside host today. And you may realise that I'm not actually alone. So for the first time we have two hosts for today's broadcast on the top side. And this is the wonderful Johanna from the Department of Hi. Environment, who we are super stoked to have joining us today. And we also have the wonderful Katie, who is going to be our underwater educator. Now, we have watched many Reefs Go Lives this season. So you know that you have the screen on your computer and then just to the right of it, you have the chat box. I would like all of you viewers to please type in as many questions as you possibly can throughout this broadcast because we would like to answer as many as we can throughout the duration of this program. You should also all have your in-class activity sheet, so keep that close because I'm going to be speaking about that a little bit later on. So what are we actually going to talk about in today's broadcast? Well, we have a lot of really big topics all on food chains. So we are going to be covering what is the difference between a food chain and a food web, the importance of maintaining these food chains and food web, the responses within a food chain or a food web if you introduce an invasive species or remove a keystone species, and what you at home or school can do to help ensure the healthy food chains and food webs in the future. Now, I think we're just about ready to get started up here, so without further ado, Katie, how are you doing down there? Hey, Maisie and Johanna, we're doing great down here. Our underwater team is just uh, watching this little school of sailor's choice and grunts in front of us, and I think we're about ready to get started whenever you guys are. Sweet, sounds awesome. Well, Katie, to get us started, what is the difference between a food chain and a food web? That's an excellent place to start. And for you dive buddies, these fishes are going to be a main part of both the food chains that we talk about and the food webs. A food chain is a basic term that we like to use to describe the link of animals or organisms across this coral reef or a terrestrial ecosystem as well and how the energy is transferred from each of those organisms, from a primary producer, which is at the very bottom of that food chain, next to consumers, predators, mesopredators, and apex predators. So, for example, you students can see this beautiful reef behind me. This is Jackson's Reef on Little Cayman. We are in the Bloody Bay Marine Park, and all of the organisms that you see on this reef are part of that food chain that I mentioned. Now, if we swim over here, and we see there's some really nice soft corals on this reef with lots of smaller fishes, they're all a part of that reef system. So, the plankton or the algae that's floating around in this water column even though you dive buddies can't see it, that's the basis of the bottom of the food chain. Now you're going to see a couple smaller fishes on the reef behind me. Just here we've got some blue chromis, these bright blue fishes with the black heads and the black lines on their tails. You'll see them a lot throughout our dive. Those guys are going to be eating a lot of that plankton in the water column. So it's primary producers, then those chromis, and then if we get a chance to see a grouper or a snapper, those fish might eat these blue chromis. And then, of course, what eats a grouper or a snapper? Sometimes a shark. So keep your eyes out because we might get a chance to see one of those. And the food or the energy that's transferred in between all of those organisms, that chain that it creates, the link from one to the next, that's a food chain. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for that explanation, Katie. And I would just like everyone watching to get out your in-class activity sheet. So I've actually got a copy of it up here. It's waving around a little bit because it's a bit windy on the boat today. But you can see here that we have the primary producers at the bottom. 
and then it goes to the consumers, the meso predators, and then the apex predators. And as we are traveling up this food chain, the population is decreasing. So really nice clear diagram here, and we have an example just to the right of it as well. And throughout the duration of this class, I, we would like you guys to fill out two more that are just right out the bottom here. So Katie, now that we understand what a food chain is, do you mind explaining what a food web is? Absolutely. So you dive buddies probably know some of the fishes that I listed earlier. Or rather, you know about these chromis, these little blue guys. There's some juvenile fish up here as well, some smaller yellow ones. Juvenile bluehead wrasse, and of course some of the groupers and snappers you guys know as well. Now, I talked about a food chain. A food web is when each of these individual food chains shares energy or shares food sources that connects multiple food chains together to create a larger food web. So for example, these little juvenile yellowhead wrasse that are here, these little yellow fishes, or the blue chromis that you see here behind me as well, there's many different organisms that eat these fishes. Snappers, groupers, eels, maybe even lionfish. And then those eels or smaller groupers may get eaten by a goliath grouper or a shark. So there's many different organisms which feed or prey upon each other or consume each other that are either primary producers, consumers, meso predators, or the top of the food chain, those apex predators. But many of them will share food sources, and those commonalities are what create those food webs. Thank you for that excellent explanation, Katie. Yep. I think we really do understand the difference between a food chain and a food web now. Now, apparently some of you viewers are having a little bit of difficulty with our chat box. If you would like to refresh your browser, then that, fingers crossed, should solve that issue and you should be able to send in some really great questions to us. So, we actually are having a few questions that are coming in though, Katie, about some of the vocabulary that you're using. So, what is a primary producer, a consumer, a meso predator, and an apex predator? So, do you think you can get started with explaining what a primary producer is? Sure. So, primary producers, as I said, are typically the very lowest on the food chain or the lowest on the food pyramid. So, if you students can swim a little bit closer to me, maybe you'll see some of this stuff floating around in the water column. <laughs> As you get closer and closer and closer, you might see there's actually some very small things in the light that are kind of floating around. Many of those are probably either zooplankton or phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is microscopic plant-like organisms floating around in the water column which are producing their own energy, most likely through photosynthesis. If you dive buddies remember, we talked about that symbiotic relationship between a coral host, like these stony corals that we have right beside us, and that zooxanthellae, or the algae that lives inside of that coral, <coughs> excuse me, that gives that coral its color. That zooxanthellae is a primary producer, and it is also a phytoplankton. Now, when the zooxanthellae is not in the coral, it's out here in the water column, free swimming, it's considered plankton. There's also zooplankton, which is animal-like organisms that are microscopic as well. Very hard for us to see, but they're animals and organisms which are producing all of their own energy and do not require feeding or preying on other animals in order to get that energy. Cool, thank you for that explanation, Katie. And we just got a really good image of all of that horrible plankton inside the water column. So great. these viewers have got a great picture of that. Okay, can we move on to our next term? Now, can you explain to us what a consumer is? Absolutely. So, for you dive buddies, when you're writing out your food chains, there's a primary producer at the very bottom, and then basically everything else is a 
consumer. You and I, we're consumers because we have to eat food in order to survive because we need energy to fight diseases, to grow, to get nice and big and strong, all of that stuff. All the other creatures on the reef are very similar. So, you may see here, there's many different fishes. There's um, the bicolor damselfish, the blue chromis. There's some sergeant major over here. Even all of the corals that you see, the stony corals and the soft coral, they're all consumers because they don't actually produce their own food or their own energy. Therefore, they must get it from another source. Sweet. Thanks for that explanation, Katie. Now, how about we move on to those <coughs> predators, those meso predators and those apex predators? So, a predator is a, a broad term which describes any organism on the reef or terrestrially which is actively hunting or preying on other species. Now, I want you dive buddies to keep your eyes out because we have been seeing in the area some really big barracuda and they're a perfect example of a predator. Now, I do know also that Johanna is on the boat today with us and she's an expert on apex predators in our food chain and the importance of them in that food chain as well. So maybe she could actually answer better the difference between a meso predator and an apex predator for us. Sure, Johanna, you want to get started? Sure, I can. Thank you. Well, meso predators are mid level predators in the food chain or food web. Uh, typically situated between consumers and apex predators. An example for mesopredators that you may know, have seen before are eels, smaller snappers and smaller groupers. Apex predators are organisms which are at the top of the food chain or food web and are not typically preyed upon by other predators. So Jenna from CIS has asked us whether there are any other apex predators other than sharks. So this is for you, Jenna. An example for other apex predators are, of course, the sharks, and then also larger groupers, and us humans, of course. So did you know that, that orcas are the ultimate uh, apex predator in the ocean? We don't have them in Cayman, but in other places around the world, orcas or even sharks are preyed on by orcas. Wow, that is super cool. Thanks for that, Johanna. I wish that we could have seen some orcas on today's dive, but fingers crossed we're going to be lucky enough to see some other big apex predators, like those big groupers, and hopefully a couple of sharks if we're really, really lucky. Okay, Katie, so now that we have sorted out some of the vocab, do you actually mind doing a little swim around the reef and seeing if we can find any examples of these different consumers and predators and meso predators? Absolutely. So, you dive buddies, this is a perfect opportunity to start looking at all of the reef around me and seeing which ones you want to use as an example in your food chain on your in-class activity sheet so that you can list them as either a primary producer, a consumer, a predator, a meso-predator, or an apex predator. I know I'm a human, but I don't count. You can't write me on your in-class activity sheet. <laughs> but let me see if we can come up with some examples here. Um, actually, yes, if you students come and you dive over here with me, We've got some bright purple and yellow fishes, which are hanging out just here in between the coral. Those fishes are called fairy basslets. And even though they're a small fish, they belong to the bass family, which is very similar to the largemouth grouper family. So they are a consumer as well, and maybe even could call them a predator. Now obviously they're quite small, so I wouldn't say that they're a meso predator or an apex predator, but they are actually eating fish around the reef as well, even though they're small size. So you can include them. What else do we have around here? Oh, just below the fairy basslets, we've got some schoolmasters. Schoolmasters, oh, and the parrotfish. So we've got a princess parrotfish and some schoolmasters here. The schoolmasters 
are part of the snapper family. And they're going to be eating, I believe, other fishes as well as occasionally crustaceans with those big teeth. And then these school ha these uh, schoolmaster snappers could be preyed upon by potentially a goliath grouper, a really large grouper, or maybe even a shark. Now behind them there's a parrotfish, which is munching down on some macroalgae. And if you joined us for our last Reef Skull Live with Dr. Claire Dell, our researcher at CCMI, she was talking about the importance of these parrotfishes on the macroalgae populations around the Cayman Islands. So, even though the parrotfish is an herbivore, it's still a very important part of the ecosystem because it's scraping all of that macroalgae off of this reef, which allows space for that coral to grow. And we've talked before about competition, where things are always kind of competing for space on this reef. And those parrotfishes are a very important part of keeping everything in balance in the food chain as far as eating a lot of that macroalgae. So really great that one of the first fish we saw today was a parrotfish. Great, thanks for that little tour, Katie. We already saw so much life down there on the reef, so I hope that you guys at home or school are starting to fill out your in-class activity sheets with some of the examples that Katie just gave you. Now, we're about a third of the way through our broadcast, and I just want to check how you're doing on dive time and air down there, Katie. I just checked my dive time and my air, and I've got plenty of both, so let's go ahead and continue with the lesson. Sounds great. Well, we actually have some really cool questions that are coming in from some of our students, and Johanna is going to be reading them out to you, Katie, so you can hopefully answer them underwater. So Sasha from grade 2 at CIS has asked, what eats an apex predator to keep them in balance? Who was that at CIS that asked that question? It was Sasha. Sasha, Sasha at CIS. That's an excellent question. Who eats apex predators? <laughs> well, uh, sadly, we do. <laughs> and other organisms as well. So you students may have heard earlier, Johanna mentioned that the biggest apex predator in the whole world is actually the orca. Now, we don't have any orcas here in Cayman or typically in the Caribbean at all, but as the top of the food chain is humans. Now, as we'll touch on later, we're not fishing for sharks in the Cayman Islands anymore, but some places do. And the only people, the only things that are really fishing for those sharks are the orcas and potentially even humans. So I would say that we are the biggest apex predator in the Caribbean. That's an awesome Arctic answer, Katie, and thank you for that great question, Sasha. And I think we have a few more coming in as well. Yes, we do. So Brian in Grand Cayman wants to know, you said that corals are a consumer, but he thought that they had a symbiotic relationship with its algae that gave the coral all of its food. Can you explain, Katie? Absolutely. So, Brian, that's an excellent question. And if you actually swim in towards me, we've got a, a soft coral here that I think is the perfect example to show you how they're a consumer. So, all of these fuzzy things here, they're also corals, but they're soft corals, not stony corals. So, they're not really building this reef, but this is a soft coral as well. And you can see these individual polyps on this soft coral, they almost have little arms. Those are its tentacles. Each one of these tentacles, inside of the polyp that it's attached to, they have those zooxanthellae, or those photosynthetic algae, which are taking in that sunlight and converting it into energy or food for the coral. But this only makes up for 90 to 95 percent of the nutrients that the coral needs. That other 5 percent comes from these tiny polyps with those little arms. They're reaching out and actively grabbing at food that's passing by in the water column. Maybe we can't see it, but it's microscopic 
and it's there. And they're able to grab onto it and actually bring that food into the center. And that's how corals are a consumer. They are actually both. They're producing their own food with the assistance of that zooxanthellae living inside of them. But they're also actively catching that food as it floats by. So that's an excellent question. That's so exciting, and thank you so much for that question, Brian. I just want to remind you viewers that I know that some of you have been having a little bit of trouble with our chat box, and refreshing the browser is working for most people. So if you are still having issues with that, then do just press refresh, and hopefully you should be able to send in some great questions to us, because we love it when you guys send in questions that we can answer live for you. Okay, Katie, I think we've all got a pretty good understanding of food chains, food webs, as well as what some of those mesopredators, consumers, primary producers are. Now, one consumer and predator that you mentioned earlier was a lionfish, which I know is also an invasive species. So do you think that you could tell our viewers a little bit about invasive species and how they can impact food chains and food webs? And you know what? We actually have not seen an invasive species yet on this dive, so that's great news. But if any of you dive buddies do see a lionfish at any time behind me or throughout the broadcast, please let us know in that chat box so we can point it out to you if somebody has not seen a lionfish before. Now, I think what Maisie was asking me to tell you guys about was how the introduction of an invasive species can change those food chains or the food web overall. And how that happens is it's kind of a disruptor. An invasive species is a species that is introduced to an ecosystem that's not from that geographic range. For example, the lionfish, which is a very common example here in the Caribbean as well as in Cayman, is actually from the Indo-Pacific reefs, out all the way on the other side of the world. But it came over here through various potential mechanisms that we're really unsure of, but we have a good idea. Anyway, they're here now. And the issue we're having with that invasive species on our food chains is that lionfish are what we call a voracious opportunistic feeder. They eat everything. <laughs> they have no preference for food. They will eat the shrimp out of the sand. They will eat a lot of these fishes that you see on the reef behind me, especially those little yellow and purple fairy basslets. We see those a lot in the stomach contents of lionfish. And they'll even eat other lionfish. So they're coming into this beautiful reef system and they're eating almost everything on it. They have no particular, like, they have no uh, favorites, really. They're eating almost everything. So that's disrupting the food chain because they're taking away food sources that would be otherwise naturally taken by larger meso predators or even larger apex predators. So an invasive species can really disrupt that entire food chain and food web. Definitely. And actually, I have a question for you, Johanna. Have you ever seen any evidence of any areas where lionfish have taken over an area as, say, an apex predator? Yes, actually, I have. So there are reports from Bonaire where lionfish took the place from the apex predator on the reef. But here in Cayman, our reefs are relatively good. We are really lucky that our continental shelf is relatively narrow and the early detection plus the great culling effort um, has keep kept our uh, lionfish populations under control. Um, at places where the lionfish took the place of the apex predator, the, the natural apex predator such as the sharks and the groupers they became less and less, and they may even eventually become locally extinct. Wow, we're very lucky that that has not happened here in the Cayman Islands. And you actually just touched on a question that I was just going to ask um, you to explain, which was, I know that maybe humans may have been one of the reasons why. Oh, apparently we have an eagle ray which has just joined us on camera down there. <laughs> 
<laughs> we'll just break our question for a moment. Oh, uh, yeah, it's kind of gone now, but he swam by while Johanna was talking to us no. about Apex Predators and Mizo Predators as if we, like, called him out here to the reef. <laughs> Well, it does just go to show that we do still have healthy predators here, despite the fact that we do have an invasive lionfish. So, going back to the question that I was going to ask you, Johanna, was that, you know, we know that lionfish are in these waters, and humans may have caused them to be here, we're not quite sure, but it's likely that we are involved. But is there any way that us humans can try and remove this lionfish from the environment that we have around the Cayman Islands? Yes, absolutely. People can help eliminate this particular invasive species by culling efforts. There are many culling efforts ongoing on the, around the Caribbean. But however, in Cayman, this charge is led by the Department of Environment. Um, first of all, you need a lionfish license from the DOE. The DOE is able to teach divers and snorkelers how to properly treat the um, potential sting and cull lionfish. The permit allows selected colors to then cull lionfish on our reefs. This is a Cayman Island wild, uh, wide effort <laughs> with many different organizations, including CCMI assisting with keeping the numbers low. And we are definitely seeing a difference in our reefs. So this is good news. Wow, that's great. Thanks for that, Johanna. They were all great points that you just raised there. And you students that are watching, you actually can't get that license until you're the age of 16. But there are many things that you can do right now to try and reduce the lionfish population. And the main one that you can do is you can eat lionfish. One, because it is super delicious. And two, because by eating... Um, by eating that lionfish, you are removing it from the environment and helping to reduce some of the impacts that it's facing, probably saving a few of those fairy basslets that Katie pointed out earlier. And, Yay, yummy. <laughs> and another way that you can try and help is by, with any invasive or exotic pets that you may have, most of you guys probably won't have a pet lionfish, but any exotic pet that you do have, please do just try not to release that into its unnatural environment. Because this is one of the theories of how the lionfish population got so big, was that people that had lionfish in their tank did not want them anymore because they were eating everything, and then they went out into the marine environment and the population exploded. So those are two ways that you can help right now. Now, that we touched on invasive species, and we know that they have a negative effect on the food chains and the food webs. Katie, are there any other types of organisms that if you add or remove, can have an impact on these food chains and food webs as well? And they're called keystone species. And actually, while our cameraman Sam was trying to get you guys a good shot to see that eagle ray, I sort of swam up onto the reef here to see if I could find one, and we did find one. Now, a keystone species is an organism that without that organism's presence in the ecosystem, you could potentially have ecosystem collapse. If any of you of our dive buddies have seen a bridge or an archway, the keystone is the top stone in the very top of the arch that if you remove that keystone, the entire archway will fall. So there are certain organisms on the reef that without which we wouldn't have a healthy reef system or healthy food chains. So actually, right down in the middle of this coral, in between the little nooks and crannies, you will see, as our cameraman Sam comes in closer, a reef sea urchin. Now, the particular species, this reef sea urchin, is not the keystone species that I really wanted to highlight. I wanted to find you a different kind of urchin called a long spine sea urchin, but this is a similar species. Now, what makes these so important? is because all sea urchins, similar to the reef sea urchin that you're seeing now, and the long spine sea urchin, is that these are key herbivores on the reef, or animals that are consuming a lot of this macroalgae. Like, we got to see that parrotfish.
fish eating earlier as well. But back in the 1970s and 80s, these long-spined sea urchins were all over the reef. Now, there was a disease that ran around only affecting that one species of urchin that has since left our Caribbean seas. And so, after the population of those urchins went way down, ever since the 1970s, it slowly started to come back up. And that's why we're seeing some of these urchins on the reef during the day, because normally they're nocturnal, or they don't really come out of the reef until nighttime. That's when they like to feed the most. And that's why during the day, like now, if you do find them, they're normally down in those cracks and crevices. But back to them being a keystone species, without these urchins mowing the lawn or eating all of the algae on this reef, the reef would be overrun with seaweeds or macroalgae. Like many of you students may have seen last week with our researcher, Dr. Claire Dell, in her, um, her reefs go live, we learned about the importance of seaweeds and the importance of the herbivores that eat those seaweeds. And this sea urchin is a key part of our Caribbean coral reefs to make sure that these ecosystems and food chains remain healthy and intact for a long time to come. I totally agree, Katie, and I bet our viewers at home and school didn't realize how important sea urchins are for the reefs. So I hope that you guys viewing try and protect them as much as you possibly can in the future. And all of this discussion about keystone species and invasive species does just really go to show how much some species can have an effect on food chains and on food webs. Now, we actually just got a really good question in from Tate. Um, he was asking, how fast do lionfish reproduce? Now, Tate, lionfish actually can produce up to 2 million eggs a year. So you can see they can have a huge, huge population increase and have a massive impact as an invasive species on the food chains and food webs. So awesome question. Keep them coming in, guys. Now, Katie, we're a little bit further along in our broadcast. I just want to see how you are doing on dive time and air down there. Um, I've got plenty of air, Maisie. We're pretty shallow as we're trying to talk about a lot of the top portion of this reef, and i got plenty of dive time as well, so lots of time for questions if we have time in the broadcast. <laughs> Sweet, that sounds great. Well, what I'm actually going to do now is I'm going to pass you on to Johanna, who is our fabulous guest, because I would like her to talk to us a little bit more about how scientists can actually measure the populations of some apex predators. Sounds great. So, we are using brush to establish or to study our shark population in Cayman. It's one of a few... Uh, research methods, but this is what I'm going to talk to about uh, today. So BRAF stands for Baited Remote Underwater Video <coughs> Survey. And it's essentially a camera trap. It is a non-invasive method that is used all around the world to study f fish populations. And we are using it here in Cayman to study our sharks. So this is a BRAF unit. Our wonderful assistant Beth is yes, just going to pick this up for us and uh, hand it up. Okay. <laughs> Very small go. boat and big bits of equipment. <laughs> so it's a upside down crate with a pole and a bait bag. And can you hand me the, the GoPro? Not, not really. I'm not going to be able to reach it. Beth is going to move around and find you the GoPro. Okay. <laughs> so the GoPro comes into here in this little cage and is facing the bait arm and the bait uh, back. So there will be bait in the bait back and then we lower it down over the side of the boat and we leave it soaking for two hours and the camera is recording what comes in the field of view. So let me just... <laughs> Tight. <laughs> so we record the footage for two hours and then we watch it and this way we can see what species show up, um, how many sharks there are around the island, which areas and between the islands, um, whether they prefer sandy or reef habitat 
and we can also see how healthy or how many babies and mummies and daddy sharks are around. Wow, Johanna, that sounds like such an awesome project. Is there any way that our viewers at home or school can actually get involved in this program and research? Yes, so the Department of Environment has a summer camp, so when you're a little bit older, you can get involved in there. In the meantime, you as a class or school can adopt a shark. So recently, CIS and Cayman Prep have raised enough funds to adopt the shark and actually buy a satellite tag which we deployed in March on a Caribbean reef shark. And this is one way how you can help us improve our research on our Cayman sharks. The other thing is if you go snorkeling and you do see a shark, call the DOE and report it to us. Sweet, those are some awesome suggestions. Now I want to get involved with your project as well. I want to come <laughs> volunteer in your boat. It sounds like so much fun. Okay, we are having some really great questions that are actually coming in about your bobs. So we actually have one that has just come in from Jamie on K1 Brack, who wants to know, does a bob actually hurt the, you know, the sharks that you're trying to survey at all? No, not at all. It's a non-invasive method, Jamie. And the way, it's a way to study the fish, so it's recording it, and it doesn't touch or harm the sharks at all. Okay, sweet, because the last thing we want to do is actually harm those shark populations that we're trying to, you know, help protect. Now, we have another question that has just come in from Lindsay on Grand Cayman, and she's saying, isn't it actually bad to feed animals? Isn't it bad for us to be putting bait in the water and, you know, having an effect of feeding them? Yes, absolutely, and that's why it is illegal in Cayman to feed wildlife outside of the um, Stingray City or like um, the interaction zone. The fish are not fed with the broths, they are only attracted by the scent. Okay, that's good, so it's not affecting their feeding habits at all. at all. Okay, sweet. Now we have another question that's just coming from Scott on Grand, who is very enthusiastic and wants to build his own broth. Is he able to do this? No, <laughs> well, we are able to do it, but you can't use it because it's a scientific method and it needs a special permission by the DOE. Okay, Scott, so in the future, I would definitely recommend that you reach out to the DOE and Johanna and then you can go and volunteer on her boat rather than building your own prop because we don't want you to, you know, cause any damage in the marine environment that you're obviously so enthusiastic about studying. Come on with us. <laughs> Okay, thanks Johanna for explaining to our dive buddies all about um, the bras and I'm sure the DOE is going to have a huge influx of volunteers that are going to want to come and work with you in the future. Um, Katie, how are you doing down there? Sorry, we kind of cut you off for about five minutes there. You still okay? No, it's great. <laughs> we just found a tiger grouper swimming through this little uh, channel in between the reef and there's a ton of fish in there. <laughs> Sam is uh, trying to get as close as he can without going too deep into the channel, but there's a little tiger grouper swimming away from us, and there's several schools of schoolmasters, and I see some mahogany snapper in there, and some blue tangs, and yeah, that little tiger grouper is not quite its terminal uh, adult phase yet, but really had some beautiful stripes, and that's a key uh, part of these reefs is those tiger groupers and the Nassau grouper. So I hope that our dive buddies have been keeping their eyes out while, while also seeing that amazing, that really cool brub with Johanna. But we've seen a couple of those awesome fish down here. It's been it's a beautiful dive, as you can see, so keeping our eye out. Yeah, definitely. And I think we actually have time for a few more questions. So, Johanna, would you like to read some of them out? We've got so many coming in, which is really, really great. So, yes, of course. Josh from Lighthouse School asked, what is the main apex predator in Cayman waters? I think I can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> Take it away. <laughs> I, I think it's sharks, definitely. <laughs> So, um, Sebastian from Cayman Prep, year four, would like to know about the different food chains in the trench. Good question. Katie? That is an excellent question. Who asked that? Sebastian. Well, Sebastian, different food chains in the Cayman Trench. <laughs> I have to say, I wasn't expecting 
asked me that question. I know, it's like, I know that. <laughs> but you're right. Every every ecosystem on our planet has food chains. And whether they're marine or terrestrial based, you'll find them everywhere. So I have to admit, I personally have never dove in the Cayman Trench. If any of you joined us where at our reef school I have a few weeks ago where actually Maisie was our educator, we had a diving off the wall reef school live and Maisie went down a bit deeper over the the wall of Little Cayman and if you followed that wall deep, 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 down to about 6,000 feet or so, there are actually some deep water thermal vents, and those thermal vents look like little mouths that are producing plumes of smoke, and that smoke is actually nutrients coming out of the Earth's crust, or that area where those tectonic plates are meeting, and that nutrients coming out of there is feeding all of the primary producers that you and I can't see, but they're here. And then those primary producers, down super deep in the trench, are feeding other small fishes, probably similar to the fishes that you've seen throughout our dive today, but of course they'll probably be a little more well adapted to very dark conditions where there's no light, because down at 6,000 feet, not a whole lot of light down there. <laughs> it's called the aphotic zone, which Maisie spoke about in her Reef Skull Live, because there's no sunlight that reaches that depth, but there are still animals down there. So primary producers, smaller fishes, and maybe deep, slightly bigger fishes, or probably some sharks as well. That's sweet. Thanks for that explanation, Katie. Oh, and it is a great question. Yeah, it's well, a great question from Sebastian. And it's just so cool that even down in the deepest, darkest parts of the ocean, there are still the same sort of food chains that we're actually seeing here in a tropical reef as well. So awesome question, Sebastian. Thank you for sending that in. Okay, Katie, I would actually like us to move on to our next section. So we know a lot about food chains and food webs and why some of the species are really, really important for those. But now I want to ask how we can try to keep these food chains and food webs nice and healthy for future generations. Hi, buddies, joining us today. You've come on a Reef School Live with us before, so this is not your first dive. However, we've talked a lot about how everything is connected. And Sam right now is getting a good shot of some coral on the reef and some macroalgae, as well as some fishes. And everything that we do is contributing to the overall health of this coral reef ecosystem and all of its food chains and its food webs. So you'll remember that last on our last couple of dives, we've spoken about just general good environmental practices and how to be a good environmental steward. Things like following your local fishing regulations, which is something that Johanna touched on when she was showing us our bruv. Making sure that you are minimizing your carbon footprint or the amount of CO2 that's going into the atmosphere and ultimately ending up on our coral reefs. You can do that by minimizing your electricity, using less fresh water, choosing to eat more sustainably and more vegetables and things like that. And then, of course, remembering your five R's. Reduce, reuse, recycle, rethink, and refuse things like single-use plastics and disposable items such as uh, styrofoam and takeout containers and things like that. All things that each of us, and especially you dive buddies, can do to help ensure that each of these organisms on the reef remains a healthy part of the ecosystem for long time to come. We completely agree with you, Katie, and those were some great suggestions to try and, you know, keep these um, these food webs and food chains nice and healthy in the future. Now, Johanna, do you have any more suggestions that you would like to add on top of that? Katie covered it pretty good. However, I do have maybe one thing to add. 
it is illegal to kill sharks in Cayman, so when you do catch a shark accidentally, release it or cut the line. The other thing is, the, you may have heard about the extension or the plan for ex extension of the marine protected areas. So once they are in place, they will help and improve our um, protection of our fish and will benefit the population. So once they are in place, please respect the re like re new regulations. And don't fish out of season. That means you don't take any fi seafood when they are not allowed to be fished. For example, at the moment, conch and lobster are not allowed to be fished. That means because they are um, reproducing right now and creating new babies, so we have conch and lobster for many years ahead. Sweet, thank you for those suggestions, Johanna. And we actually just got a question in from Sasha, and I think it relates to what you were just saying about not killing sharks. Because Sasha from grade two at CIS has asked, what will happen if we don't have as many apex predators? Which is what would happen if people were going out and killing sharks. So do you mind answering that question for us? Yes, of course. Great question, uh, Sasha. So. When there are no apex predators, the mesopredators, which are getting eaten by the apex predators, are expanding. So they are then again eating more of the um, like little critters, like zooplankton, for example. And then these ones are not the, the population gets less and less and less. So what do they eat again? They are eating algae. So the algae then uh, doesn't get eaten much and will actually expand so this means bad news for our coral reefs because the algae will overgrow and the coral don't have a chance to come through great thanks for answering that question johanna Next question now i think we've actually finished up our broadcast for today we are nearly running over because we've had so many awesome questions from you guys at home and school so thanks so much for sending those in but we do have to wrap up right now so katie before we look off do you have any parting words for our students that are watching oh shame well our cameraman sam just found a beautiful french angel fish so, <laughs> so beautiful he's trying to get a shot of that as he's swam by <laughs> i guess um shame that we've, we've run out of time we just also found a whole like school of nudibranch on this little uh what? this little purple sea fan down here just another proof that everything is connected um we've got about 10 of these teeny tiny little nudibranchs on this little purple sea fan <laughs> i know i know we have to go but i wanted to make sure that our students got a chance to potentially see some of these beautiful tiny creatures oh that definitely and what stage on the food chain you would say they are uh those nudibranchs i would say they're consumers they're probably not producing their own food this species there are some nudibranchs which actually do have photosynthetic algae that live inside of their gills but this species does not these guys are on this soft coral because they're actually a corellivore or an organism which eats corals so they're a consumer or probably the lowest on the food chain of the uh, of the predators <laughs> i would say but anyway sorry i guess i have to say goodbye so i'm sorry <laughs> thank you students for joining us underwater today it's always super fun to have you guys join us and i hope that as usual you learned something new from us and our team down here we couldn't do it without the whole team and of course without each of you joining us and helping us to make sure that we are preserving this incredible coral reef system all around us. So thank you guys so much, and we'll see you when I join you as the educator again live on World Oceans Day on June 8th. So I hope you'll be my dive buddies again. And until then, we'll see you later. Safe diving. Great. Thanks, Katie. We will see you topside in a bit. So, students, you have managed to learn so many different things today that I'm just going to recap. So, we have learned the difference between a food chain and a food web. We've learned about primary producers, consumers, mesopredators, apex predators, invasive species, and keystone species. So, lots of new words to add into your um, dictionary. <laughs> We have learned about the transfer of energy up and down the food web and what each of us can do to help ensure that we have healthy food webs 
and food chains in the future. Now, we have tried to answer as many questions as we possibly can in this broadcast, which is why I think we've run over a little bit. But you guys have had so many, which is really awesome. So please do keep sending us in any last minute questions that you have. And then once Katie is topside, we will answer those as soon as we can. And we will post them on our YouTube page so that you can um, view those answers in class within the next couple of days. So I just want to say a huge thank you to the Risco Live team, a massive thank you to Johanna from the Department of Environment for joining us. We've had an awesome time together on the boat today and we've learned so much cool stuff about rubs. And just like to say a big thank you to our audience at home for joining in and viewing this program. And we will see you very soon for our next Reefs Go Live broadcast on World Oceans Day in a couple of weeks' time. So from us, goodbye and thank you so much for joining us. <laughs>